Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 2022 meeting of Triangle Association of Freelancers. My name is Don Vaughn, and our guest this evening is Elisa Jordan, the editor of Veterinary Practice News Magazine. Everyone, please welcome Elisa. Hey there. Really appreciate you joining us today, Elisa. I want to talk about the magazine and your editorial needs and, and a lot of other things, but I wanted to ask about your um, writing and publishing experience prior to joining Veterinary mm -hmm. Practice News. Um, tell us a little bit about your professional journey. So I've worked on Veterinary Practice News twice, um, but I'll, I'll get started. Um, my first job in publishing was an after school job when I was in college. I worked for a small publishing company called 21361. And I started as an intern and then just got kind of a small office job. And that is a, a small book, book company in Hollywood that was founded by Henry Rollins, who's kind of a famous um, punk rock singer and spoken word artist. And so I worked, um, at his place when I was in school at UCLA. And then I moved on to what was then fancy publications um, after I graduated and it later became Bowtie, but that was the mm -hmm. company that had Dog Fancy and Cat Fancy and Bird Talk and all these animal magazines. And I thought, well, I'll get a job there because I like animals. And I ended up on Pet Product News, which is a, a magazine that's still in existence um and it goes to um independent retailers people who own pet supply stores and i worked on that for four and a half years and um that kind of set me up for a lot of b2b experience and then from there i went to um, I started working on Ponds Magazine, Koi Magazine, and then I went to a magazine called Freshwater and Marine Aquarium. And then um, at this time I was working on a master's degree and I um, focused on my master's degree. I left Bowtie and was focusing on my master's degree and went freelance for a few years. And then when the economy kind of bottomed out in 2008, um, the following year, I got a job at I Love Dogs, which is a or was a dog vitamin company, and I was one of their copywriters. Um, and then I got hired to go back to Bowtie, and that's when I worked on VPN the first time. So they asked me to come back and work on VPN. And I was there for quite a few years, and uh, that company started to have financial problems and they started to break off. They sold the company and then from there, it kind of chugged along for a little while, but then they started to break up the company and sell off pieces of it to other companies or they would just close magazines. So there were several rounds of layoffs and eventually I got laid off. And so I went freelance again and, um, then about a year and a half ago, this opportunity for me to go back to VPN opened up um, when I found out about it. Um, opened by a different company, of course, this time in Canada. And that's where I've, I've been. And then, um, you know, like most writers, I have a side hustle. I had a tour company, my own tour company in Hollywood. Um, but I was really niche. I specialized in doing tours of Marilyn Monroe, Jean Harlow, The Doors, and Rock and Roll. But that kind of went by the wayside during COVID. So now on the weekends, I do tours of Warner Brothers. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I think you and I have been swimming around in the same koi pond for a very long time because I wrote for all of those publications you just mentioned including pet product news way back in the 90s yeah um, and veterinary practice news I, I think my association with them dates back to around 96. Uh, my first freelance article among the first I ever sold was to cat fancy um, mm -hmm. I wrote for dog fancy critter 
all all the fun pet magazines. Um, and I know you and I must have been just crossing paths. Well, I used to hear your name in the office because I I remember you know I remember you know. Um, we all use the same freelancer. So we would, you know, cross reference or do you know this person or that person? And your name always came up. It was fun. So, I really enjoyed writing those articles. Though. Yeah. I, those were, it was great times. It was a lot of fun. Um, how long has VPN been around, you know? I have no idea. And I was racking my brains, but it might go back to the eighties, but I'm not sure. It was, it was already there when I started the company. Or when I started at the company, I should say. Tell us a little oh. bit about your current editorial mission as the editor of the magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Who is your primary readership? And I know you're veterinarians, but I think it's more specific than that. Well, we've we've found that veterinarians do read it, but we also found that um, the techs read it, and that the office staff reads it. So we, it's kind of. It's interesting because we found that we have three different types of readers and they're all reading it. So we try to have um, articles that might appeal to any of those people. So we have everything from really hardcore surgical articles to uh, managing staff to software, um, anything that would help a veterinary clinic basically because there are many facets to it. You know, everything from the day-to-day -day operations and financial stuff to um, actual medical procedures. Yeah, I have an article for you about spaying dogs in heat, which yeah. is interesting. Uh, I think that's a good example of the kind of clinical articles that you run. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but I wanted to ask, is, is VPN currently the primary veterinary trade journal? Is, is there any competition for the magazine? There is. There's um, a magazine called DVM, and then there's another magazine um, that's newer, so I'm blanking on the name, but um, one of the big veterinary schools, one of the universities has started um, a magazine. Do you have any um, regulations as far as your writers writing for other publications? Do you like to hang on to the ones or do you care if they go off and write for the competition? I don't care if they write for the competition. I know that one magazine I told you about that um, the university started and I feel bad because I can't remember their name and I know the editor because he worked for Bowtie too but they don't allow their writers to write for other magazines um it's not my my policy um you know the the company doesn't seem to mind but my view has always been a lot of writers specialize so as long as they're not giving out proprietary information, I don't care who they write for because they have to earn a living. And especially in this day and age, um, writing gigs are harder and harder to come by and they don't always pay as well. So I would never want to be the person limiting someone's income, That's but not that. everyone sees it that way. That's a very uh, forward thinking uh, position though. Um, I, and I like that. Not that I was thinking of writing for any of the other ones, but I know a lot of editors, as you noted, do have a policy restricting yeah. their writers from working for the competition. Well, I mean, if, if, if a writer went and said, hey, Elisa is doing a heartworm article in July, and it, you know, um, so I don't want to write about heartworm in July for you guys, but I can write about it, you know, in December. Well, then I'd be upset because you're giving away my editorial calendar. And it's not like we all don't write about heartworm or surgery. You know, we all write about the same topics, but it's just um, bad form to do that. Because if you're telling them something like that, then I, I really don't know what you're telling them. So as long as you're respectful, you know, I don't have a problem with it. How far out do you work, Elisa? And do you work with an editorial calendar? We do have an editorial calendar that we put together a year. Um, we have it a year in advance, and I will schedule sometimes as far as several months to a year in advance 
Um, not everyone does that, but VPN has so many articles that if I can schedule a few ahead of time, I will. So if I know, well, some of the doctors especially have really busy schedules. So if they can plan for an article, you know, I could say, well, if you want to write four times this year, let's just plan it out now. And then they have their schedule a year in advance and they can work around it. And then other people, you know, who have more flexibility, um, you know, like with you and I, we have more of a month to month calendar. Um, so I'm pretty much willing to do whatever I can. I, I like working ahead if I can do it, but you also have to be flexible with a monthly magazine because sometimes articles drop or sometimes the magazine is going to be bigger than you expect. So um, if the if the ad sales team sells more ads and it's bigger and then I have to scramble and, um, you know, I need people who can turn around copy quickly. So it's a mix of all of it. Um, let's talk a little bit more in depth about your editorial needs. We've talked about the clinical articles, mm -hmm. um, which I've written, although I'm not uh, uh, obviously a veterinarian, there is that opportunity. You also do some, some more of what I would call human interest features. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you directly, what specifically are you looking for? What, what do you need right now? And what kind of ideas are you, are you tired of or, or don't want to see? There's nothing I'm really tired of. Some things I'm, I'm careful of though, because I was getting bombarded for a while. Um, I was getting a lot of offers for euthanasia and that's a, a big need, but it was getting to the point to where everyone wanted to, to do euthanasia. And then um, CBD has been really popular. Um, so I kind of put the brakes on that for a while, but we'll probably have one later this year because it is a topic we need to cover, but it was, it was getting to be a little much. <laughs> um, <laughs> everyone was excited about it, but you know, I'm looking for the, the human interest stuff does, does well. And you know, when we put it in the newsletter, it does well, but we keep it to a minimum. And it has to be really, really good. It has to be really engaging. Um, however, what we're always looking for is something they can use in the clinic. Um, the average writer can't write a surgical article. So anytime we can have a veterinarian write, that is great. Um, but we always need things on um, you know, software, office management, uh, human resources, um, financial advice, um, tech advice, because like in the human market, um, you know, doctors call the shots, but nurses are the ones who actually carry everything out. So it's the techs who are doing things like weighing the animals or putting their IVs in. They're the ones who are giving their patient, patients the medicine. So they're the ones who have to keep watch on, um, is this surgical site infected? Is uh, the animal suffering hypothermia? Um, because you have to make sure an animal stays warm when they come out of surgery. You know, Is it getting the proper medication? Is there a complication? That kind of thing. So those types of things. And it can be tricky to, um, assign those things to a lay person. Some people can do it, a lot of people, you know, but a lot of people can't. Um, so we try to use doctors and techs for that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, again, like um, purchasing equipment is always a good thing. Um, so there are opportunities for, for lay people. Um, you know, you've assigned yes. a, couple articles, a couple articles to me that were profiles of veterinarians who are doing really unique mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Um, Tim Ober, the vet who oversees the U.S. Equestri mm -hmm. Olympic equestrian team, um, 
and Kwani uh, Stewart, who uh, takes care of pets owned by homeless people in mm -hmm. California. Um, are you looking for more of those kinds of things or are these kinds of one-offs? Um, a little of both. They have to be pretty extraordinary. Um, Kwani, it, it was so weird because you you brought him to my attention and we I had already reached out to him to do like a five questions and he said yes. And then I hadn't been able to follow up with him. Um, and actually he was brought to my attention first by one of our sales guys. Um, and then it ended up, it was, it was just perfect when you saw him too and you could do him better justice than I could by writing about him. Um, and for those, for those of you who, you know, the article is not out yet. He's a doctor who um, services uh, animals that belong to homeless people. And it's um, an incredible story and just kind of a personal element to that. Um, so um, one of the areas he serves is Skid Row in LA. And I used to do volunteer work in that area. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew what he was talking about. And so it was, um, it was kind of special to me. So I might do my Ed note on that this year. So, <laughs> or this month. He was a terrific interview and a fascinating individual, and he's doing some incredibly good work. Mm -hmm. um, and I was happy to, to, to talk to him and profile him. Elisa, what is the best way for freelancers to make a pitch to you? How, how do you like to receive queries from um, outside contributors? Uh, email, and my, you know, I'm easy to find. They could find me through you, or my email is in the magazine. Um, just make, make sure I understand what you're going for and um, how it relates to, to vets and how they can benefit. Um, it should be pretty obvious in your pitch, I would think from the topic, but, um, and also um, I get a lot of emails and I'm forgetful as Don can attest to, I'll, I'll go back and say, hey, can you remind me of the thing that we talked about? <laughs> um, so if you don't hear from me, just nudge me or um, remind me. I think that happens with a lot of editors. Yeah, yeah. you guys are yeah. overworked, but we understand that. Um, Elisa, how much uh, does um, VPN generally pay for feature articles? Usually like 300 to 350. And that's for about 1,200 to 2,000 mm -hmm. words on average. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. Um, why should freelancers who do not have a background in veterinary medicine may never have pondered this market before as something to pitch to, but why should they? Why should freelancers consider markets like VPN, trade journals like this, niche markets? What is the value to the contributor? Well, if, if you understand the market, you don't have to be a vet, but if you understand the market somehow, um, a lot of trade magazines are hurting for people who can write for them. So if you become a valued contributor or someone we can, someone the editors can trust, you will probably get a lot of work. So in that regard, I, I think it would benefit you. Um, for B2B magazines, um, if you have a good business sense, you could probably parlay that into several different industries. You know, obviously it has to um, it has to relate to their their industry somehow. But if you're a, if you're an HR representative, say, um, chances are you can probably parlay your skills into many different um, industries or if you're an office manager or that kind of thing, or just have those skills, um, you can probably find quite a bit of work. You, um, um, in addition to your editorial responsibilities with VPN, as we noted, you also, you have a side gig as a freelance writer uh -huh. uh, for magazines like Dogster and Cigar and Spirit. How does working as a freelance writer inform you as a magazine editor? So I guess I'm lucky in this regard because I see things from both 
ends. I know what it's like to want and need things on time. I also know what it's like to have life come up and bite you or um, your interviewer or your interviewee doesn't get back to you or the photos haven't come through or they're not responding. So I kind of get things from, uh, I should say I understand things from all sides because um, some sometimes the sources really don't get back to you on time or sometimes you get sick and you can't finish the article on time or someone in your family might be sick or you have to attend to that. Um, and so as a, then as an editor, I understand like, okay, take, take the weekend and, and get it to me as soon as you can. And, you know, as an editor, um, I try to be understanding of that. As a writer, I try to get my work in on time because I know what it's like to be an editor chewing your fingernails, you know, when is this going to come in? We're shipping to the printer. Or, um, so I try to be understanding on both sides. Um, how do you find um, the time to do your extra extracurricular um, writing? Not you, easily. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, um, I work long hours sometimes. <laughs> I mean, that's that's really the only answer. <laughs> um, is there anything uh, else about VPM that potential contributors should know that we haven't talked about in our conversation this evening? Anything more you'd like to say about the um, magazine or to those who might be considering pitching to you? I would say um, come up with a couple of ideas. Um, you don't, you don't have to, but come up with a couple of ideas because that will let me know you're taking working for us seriously. It will let me know that you have multiple ideas and I can maybe rely on you to come up with story ideas in the future, or that you probably have some versatility down the line. If, um, if I find I need a last minute article on something, um, you might have the talent to, to take it on. Um, let me know if you're, if you can take on work um, at the last minute or if you have assignments coming up because then I know your schedule. Um, because I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna put pressure on you to pester you if your schedule is full. But sometimes if I need a quick turnaround on something, um, it's nice, it's nice to know that, um, you know, for the next couple of months, your schedule is kind of open. It does happen once in a while. And, you know, I will love you forever if you um, can do that for me. So just like that kind of stuff. That's awesome. Um, and I'm hoping that, that this conversation will encourage a lot of people to consider writing for VPN. It's been a great experience for me over the years. Um, I've enjoyed it tremendously. It's really interesting stuff that we get to write about. So I hope all of you will consider it. Does anyone have any questions for Elisa while we have her this evening? Anyone at all? Joel? Joel, I need you to unmute. Joel, you have to unmute. There we go, Joel. He's still okay, muted. There we go. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just asking, is, is veterinary industry expanding or contracting? I, I remember years ago at a party, there was a vet who was about, he was, I guess, 60, 65, and he was complaining. He was having trouble selling his practice, and he, he blamed it on the fact that women vets were graduating, but they didn't want to go into practice. They just wanted to, to work for a practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wondered, you know, is getting, have you got a shrinking market or an expanding market or a stable one? I have tried to kind of figure that out. Um, my sense is, you know, at, at least for technology and research, it's, it's definitely growing. Um, a lot of women are going into the business over men now. But one of the problems that we're seeing is... Um, of all the doctors, 
of all, all the medical doctors in the United States, veterinarians make the least amount of money. Mm-hmm. And it's very long hours for not a lot of money. And their um, schooling is just as expensive as a human doctor or it can be. So why would they spend all that time and money to become a veterinarian if they're not going to make a great living? So they're going into other types of medicine or other industries. So in that regard, it's been very concerning because um, in, in some regards, we consider it shrinking, but then there are quite a number of people um, going to vet school. So I, I ha- I'm still trying to get a, a grip on that um, myself, but there has been concern that um, of the people becoming vets, they don't want to run their own vet clinic because then they get away from what they love, which is um, helping the animals themselves. They get into it because they want mm-hmm. to um, work with animals, but if they become a practice owner, they might make more money, but then they're an office worker or um, they do less of the, the veterinary stuff. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. Does anyone else have any questions? Judy? Make sure you unmute yourselves when you ask your question. <laughs> You're still muted. Yeah, no, I was turning up oh, the volume. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> yeah, no, I mute twice. I can mute on this and on the screen. So, <laughs> did you have a question? Oh no, I was oh. just trying to turn off, turn up I'm the sorry. volume because I couldn't hear like the ending. So, Nancy, <laughs> oh, Nancy, yeah. you look. I can't remember if I heard how many times a year does a magazine come out. Monthly. Wow. Okay. Yep. Well, and it's a it's a really large um, tabloid format. Mm-hmm. It's a large, slick magazine. It's not your standard size. It's a it's a big monster of a thing. Yeah, and it's available if you wanted to look at back issues. We put all the issues online because it's a free publication to um, anyone who works in a veterinary clinic. So um, it's, we're not selling the magazine. We earn our money from um, advertising. Oh, and another topic that's been really popular that I should mention is mental health. Um, that's a big topic of conversation because- Is that one you, one you want more of or one that you've done enough of for a while? Um, if it's really good, I would definitely consider it because it's 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 been a concern. Um, we have covered it quite a bit, but um, suicide is up in the veterinary profession. So mm-hmm. it's been very concerning. Allison? No, I- um... Hi, Elisa. Um, Hi, I'm Allison. <laughs> um, um, I'm right now. I'm. I'm. I've had a wonderful time interviewing TV vets. Good. Uh, and, gosh, you know, I, I haven't really talked like this to vets probably ever. I've been a journalist for a very, very long time, and this is the first time I've um, covered this this um, type of um, story. And I've been talking to these amazing people um, mm-hmm. who are doing these vet shows. And um, from what I've, I've learned so much, it's amazing. It, it really is. I, I did not, you know, know half, half of this. I didn't know that 70% plus of the um, of veterinarians mm-hmm. are now women, um, mm-hmm. specifically, right? I didn't yeah. know that. Um, the, uh, I just spoke to a uh, a veterinary, a veterinary uh, dermatologist. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, th- these are these are just um, amazing stories. And you know what I um, that you were talking about. You know, um, um, vets not wanting to go into it because of the money, etc. Mm-hmm. Because there's more money in um, in human medicine. Um, they, everyone that I've spoken to, uh, the critter fixers, um, Dr. Joya, um, the Heartland Docs uh, couple, they're all delighted um, from the impact and inspiration that they're giving um, to young people and children, especially. And Dr. Joya um, from Pop Goes the Vet was, um, was saying her, it gives her so much joy 
that children are writing to her, parents are writing to her, and um, just the impact of these shows in mm -hmm. general. So I've learned so much from doing this. Um, and it, that's um, great, because that's amazing. an angle I hadn't thought of. The children? Yeah, and, and so that's really good to know. And that's part of the fun is um, when these assignments come back, um, you know, learning things like that, because I'm surprised all the time. Yeah. So yeah. I, I fully recognize my, my boots aren't on the ground. I'm an editor who sits in my office all day and I'm, I'm not in a vet clinic. So I don't always know. I often don't know what's going on, what's um, trending. So um, I love hearing things like that because then, then I'm more informed too. Yeah, so there's so many kids that are inspired by these television shows and that are writing to the vets. I mean, talk, I'm talking about five, six, seven, eight-year-olds so, um, that want to be vets now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the vets that I spoke to are like very experienced, you know, 20 plus years um, having a practice. And, um, and another um, interesting um, thing that I um, learned as well, um, that the uh, Dr. Joya from Pop Goes the Vet, she's one mm -hmm. of only four black um, women dermatologists, veterinary dermatologists in oh, the whole country. Wow. So, you know, that's um, that's another thing I did not know. I mean, I didn't even know they were dermatologists. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one thing that is is growing quite a bit in the veterinary industry is um, specialties, like the, the human yeah. side, um, which is great. Um, it's great for the pets. Now, a lot of clients will complain about the prices, but, you know, as with us, when, when we have a skin problem, we go to a skin doctor. When we have a dental problem, we go to a, a dentist and it's getting to be the same thing with pets. So they are getting better care and it's great to see the market expanding in that way because that means the research is going in those directions. Yeah, and she also explained, Dr. Joya explained, um, you know, to be a general I guess what is called a general practitioner vet mm -hmm. is only eight years of only I say only it's eight years right for mm -hmm. a specialty it's another four years yeah um so that's 12 years total mm -hmm. for a for an you know for a um an expert like a dermatology uh, vet so that's a long lot of time it's a so. yeah uh, you know they they deserve to get paid well yeah exactly yeah. Allison, anyway. I'm glad you're having a lot of fun with that article. It sounds oh, like you're yeah. having a blast. Yeah. These, but it, it reminds me when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a vet for about five minutes. And I read these books. Um, and this is a long time ago. This is like in the 60s. And I read the books written by the guy who was the veterinarian at the Bronx Zoo. And he oh. wrote a couple of books about his experiences. And I fell in love with that stuff. And uh, yeah, so for about a minute, I thought this was something I wanted to do. And then I realized it was, like you said, 12 years of education involved. Well, I wouldn't have minded. So I went the lazy years. route, became a writer. I wouldn't have instead. minded the 12 years. It's blood. I can't stand blood because I wouldn't be a vet. You know, well, I the thing is, <laughs> you know, you're not working, you're working directly with animals, but um, you have a barrier in front of you in terms of the client. So one of the frustrations that a lot of vets have is um, you might tell your client, your vet needs this, this, and this, and they might say no. And it's to the detriment of the animal. And then if you love animals, that's, that's going to break your heart. And a lot of those issues are financially related, you know, yeah. the pet owner, as much as they love their animal, they simply may not have the funds for whatever it might be. Here's a shocking story. I have a friend in uh, Massachusetts who has an older cat with a litany of health issues. And in one month, she spent $10,000 yeah. on her pet. It's got all kinds of diseases and she knows in her heart, this animal really needs to be put down, but she simply at this point can't bring herself to do it. She also realizes she can't continue to spend that kind of money, mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as you love your animal. So yeah, it's an issue. Does anyone else have any questions for Elisa? Judy? Yeah, actually um, something popped into my head about the business aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about 
or I'm relating to this to, to where I teach. So lots of the students where I teach will go to say culinary school and uh -huh. then they'll go out and they'll start a, a restaurant, right? And restaurants have around an 85% to 90% failure rate within the first year. So I was wondering with veterinary medicine, if, if people are looking to go into their own practice, one, do veterinary schools actually offer business classes to help them with that? Or are they kind of like other ma majors like culinary school where you just go out and you start this business and then it, it has a high percentage of failure. And so I was wondering if vets also run into that because you could be a great vet, but if you're not good in business, your practice is going to go down. Right. So I was curious about the failure rates and if that's why some people don't want to own a practice because they don't know how to run it. And if vet schools were addressing that at all. To my knowledge, they're not addressing that. It's kind of just like something you learn when you're out there. Um, I There might be some vets who get out of school and, and try to start their own clinic. In my experience, the, the vets I've talked to have all gotten jobs at clinics and then mm -hmm. um, either purchased the clinic that they work at later in their career or then, then they go off and start their own clinic. But um, I've never heard of anyone just getting out of school and opening the clinic. I'm sure it's happened. It's just, I don't think it's the norm. I think they work under another doctor um, and then start their own clinic. One thing that is on the rise though, is um, corporations buying vet clinics. So they're not doctors who own these clinics. They're, you know, like, proper business managers buying them up right, right. and um, they might have more resources and more money but one of the complaints is yeah but they don't they understand business but they don't understand the veterinary aspect of the business and that can be frustrating for the doctors who work there so and they also uh, I, know, I know of a case and the prices went up mm -hmm. the prices of all the services went up after they were bought by mm -hmm. a corporation so um yeah some, sometimes yeah. it's a veterinary corporation and sometimes it's just a corporation who sees a profit in veterinary medicine mm -hmm. if they handle it right. correctly a uh, banfield i think remains one of the largest corporate owners yeah and vca too yeah vca yeah um that's a good point though judy it really is mm -hmm. any other questions for for elisa i have a comment yeah, yeah. Anna? um you're just talking about these corporations taking over and that's something the new that's been happening in the triangle area all throughout North Carolina and I'm sure other states mm -hmm. that people loathe their vets that they've gone to them for years and years and all of a sudden a corporation comes in takes over raises all the prices really sky high and also start bringing in their own staff mm -hmm. and people are not happy <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and there there is an organization, and she, I'm, I'm um, forgetting their name, but it's kind of like Ace, you know, like when you go to an Ace Hardware, that's kind of like, they could be an independent hardware store, but they contract with Ace to get their resources, so they might get insurance through them, or... Mm -hmm. Like a franchise? Yeah, um, um, like a consortium kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So the veterinary, there was one company trying to start that with the veterinary company. And that would be like, if you join their consortium, then you could um, get the bulk discount for employee insurance. And um, you could get their bulk discount for, you know, purchasing medicines and, and stuff like that. So you're, you're kind of an independent, but you have access to the benefits of a larger corporation, that kind of thing. Alisa, are you also a book author? I am. Tell us a little bit about those projects. So I did a couple of children's books. Um, it, it's actually an educational company called TCM, Teacher Created Materials. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked with them for a long time because I've been too busy, but um, they put out different um, different topics for different grades. Um, so I did one on building a space shuttle, one on um, Mexican artifacts. I did one on 
um, museums. I did, oh, I did one on muscle cars and it was kind of a clever way to teach kids about math and engineering. So I thought that was kind of fun. Um, and then I did one um, on Rock Haven Sanitarium. Have I told you about that, Don? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I wrote one on um, a real sanitarium here in Southern California, and just kind of a a backstory. It's um, so it was started in 1923, and it it was started by um, an RN, a nurse who specialized in working in sanitariums. Um, and what, what she saw was the female patients were getting um, abused by either the male patients or sometimes the male employees. Um, patients in general were treated kind of like jail inmates. They weren't always treated with dignity and respect. Um, they, um, she noticed the architecture was really intimidating. It looks like a big hospital. So when people would pull up with their loved ones, everyone would get scared, not just the person with mental health problems, but the family, because it looked like, you know, something out of a movie with an, you know, an insane asylum. So what she did was she said, okay, I'm going to start my own sanitarium by women for women. So she started, she rented a house and had six patients. They were all women. She only hired women um, and that kept them safe against assaults. Um, now men back then in the 1920s, there were no women doctors, they were all men, but they weren't there every day. So it was, you know, all the nurses and the administrative staff were all women. Um, so she was creating a safe environment for the women who lived there and it was offering um, career paths to women before the women's movement. So um, it was successful. She was able to buy the property she was renting and then she purchased houses in the area. Like this is in the area, in the era of the little bungalow and she moved them to the property cause she didn't want a big scary hospital. She had little houses on her property and um, she found that the women were more successful in getting well if they were living in these little houses because they felt like they were at home, they were comfortable. They all ate together in a cafeteria, but it was decorated to look like um, a, a, a family dining room. Um, instead of treating them like inmates, she had discovered while in her work that if you kept um, their minds busy, you know, with projects or um, gardening. It kept their minds busy. It helped them heal faster. They didn't retreat into their illness. And they would even do things like go on shopping trips, get their nails done, go to restaurants for holidays. They had Sunday dinners with their families and they would come visit and it was really successful. Um, and it, it lasted for decades. Her granddaughter took it over and um, it, it's, they're trying to save the property from uh, demolition because the city wants to tear it down now. But anyway, I wrote the book. Um, I discovered the property because that's where Marilyn Monroe had her mother. Um, when she started making money, she placed her mother there. And I went to visit the property. I found out they had tours. And I kind of just never left in a way because um, I fell in love with the story and I thought, why, why don't more people know about this? This is incredible because it, um, you know, she was doing a service to people um, in the mental health industry, to women. And um, so anyway, I wrote the book and it looked like the, the property was going to be raised and, um, Joanna, who runs the organization who was trying to save the property, would give the book out to anyone she could think of. So local politicians who we found out, you know, will lie right to your face. Um, and then she got it in the hands of a California senator and he asked for some more books and passed them out to some of the women in Sacramento, the, the capital. 
And that's what started to change things around. Once they had a book and it looked like, okay, this is a historical landmark. We need to protect this. And it was those women who um, earmarked $8 million to try to save the property. That's terrific. The power of the written word, everyone. <laughs> Big time. Um, back to VPN just for a moment. Allison yeah. said that she, um, talking to the vets that she's been interviewing, um, a lot of them treat wildlife in addition to pets. She was wondering if the treatment of wildlife is a topic you might be interested in. It's a topic I'm interested in because I like wildlife. Um, so yes, um, that's one of the benefits of, of the wild side column. And also um, I wrote, um, and the short answer is yes. Um, I, I wrote an Ed note a couple of months ago that got a lot of attention, which I was kind of surprised about. There was an incident in um, a zoo and someone who was hired to come on the property to clean or something, something like that, uh, an adult, someone who should have known better, was on the property and went into a um, an area where he wasn't supposed to be. It was clearly marked he's not supposed to go in there because he wanted to pet a tiger. Again, this is an adult who should know better, who went into an area he knew he wasn't supposed to go into and then reached into the tiger enclosure and got attacked. Um, and he lived, but they put the tiger down because of it. And I used to volunteer at a a, an exotic cat sanctuary. So as an animal lover, I found that story really disturbing. And as someone who had worked around big cats, I found that really disturbing because I understood that um, the human was in the wrong. And I, I was really, I, I couldn't think about anything else that day. So anyway, I wrote, I wrote my editor's note about that. And I started hearing from veterinarians who worked with exotics and, you know, worked in conservation and things like that. And um, so that's brought out a new element to the magazine that I wasn't expecting. I recently emailed, um, I'm going to Dollywood in a few weeks and I found out that they have, um, an eagle sanctuary on the property, which I thought was super cool. I didn't know that. And I wanted to interview them, but uh, they haven't responded to my email. I hope they do. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Before we let Elisa go, any concluding questions for her? I just have one other uh, possible story idea. My, my brother-in-law is uh, a manager for resort hotels for Hyatt. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting him in the in the um, Hawaiian Hyatt Resort. It's it's good to have connections if you want to travel. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed he, they they have all kinds of wild animals that you know are part of the the uh, hotel grounds. He told me they spend eighty thousand dollars a year. This was ten years ago. Eighty thousand dollars a year on vet bills. And, you know, for maintaining, I, I was just surprised to find that the high-end hotels, as a matter of course, will will have um, a zoo. Mm -hmm. And if you know, if there's a, a story there, I'm I'm not particularly interested in chasing the, that one down. But uh -huh. uh, that's an interesting who, who idea, to, though. You know, go to some high-end hotels and, and ask around. I'm um, I'm sure you might find um, it interesting. How how many little zoos there are, or, you know, corporate camels or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities other than, you know, your local dog and cat vet. Um, I'm I'm not a vet, obviously, but if I had become a vet, I'd probably go the route of, um, you, you know, like exotics or something like that. Um, so that's kind of where my heart is. So there, you, there are opportunities outside of the clinic for sure. Mm -hmm. And we've even had, uh, I just reached out to them again, a couple of vets who work for the government 
um, because people try to bring in animals who might have parvo or other diseases. Um, a lot of the times they're, they're sneaked into the um, country. And um, so it's their job to check, you know, these puppies to make sure they don't have parvo or things like that. So that's even another route. And actually I'm for Elisa right now, I'm profiling the Army Veterinary Corps. Um, which is extremely broad and, you know, a lot of very unique opportunities in the United States and abroad for veterinarians. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, Elisa, I, I'm sure you want to break and go out to dinner. I can't thank you enough for the time oh, you've given you us today. Me. We really thank appreciate you. it so much. Um, and thank you so much for everything, uh, telling us about VPN and uh, listening to our ideas. We really appreciate all of it. Anytime. Yep, that was great. You're yeah. welcome to stick with us. We're just gonna do a real quick thing where everybody shares whatever good news they have. Um, <laughs> and does anyone have any good news to share? Any sales, anything going on, Hannah? I've got one, I have another poem coming out soon. Oh, great, where? A social justice uh, magazine. Excellent. Yeah, so it cool. came from an ex friend of mine who came at me one day saying, the Blacks are taking over the post office. <laughs> about fellow yeah. number four. <laughs> so it's about that. <laughs> Congratulations. Inspiration can come from anywhere. That's yes, for sure. Can. Anyone else have any good news to share? I, I uh, don't have so much good news. Well, I feel like it's good news because I'm practically finished with a manuscript. Um, that I'm going to be asking for some beta readers for my uh, my book, Our War with Paraguay and How to Sit in a Hoop Skirt, which uh, ought to come out to about 85,000 words and something like 100 illustrations. But uh, I learned my lesson last time I, I had, a, had a book coming out and I had a bunch of beta readers and it was great. I mean, it was, you know, there's people that will edit for you know, punctuation and grammar and other people will edit for continuity and so forth, just people's styles. So anybody who wants to learn about the war with Paraguay and how to work, walk in a hoop skirt, um, I'll be sending out a letter shortly to the, to the group. Awesome. That's going to be a fun book. I can't wait to see that. Yeah. <laughs> I know my sons might be interested in being a beta reader for that. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, I'm sure others in TAF will too. Um, all right, does any, Allison, did you have something? Oh yeah, I just wanted to um, make a comment. Um, I'm really enjoying, and um, the, uh, well, uh, Writer's Digest, you know, I had a lot, of, uh, not a lot, but three pieces in Writer's Digest last year, one for the magazine and two on the website. And um, in, I think it was December, like the last week in December, I, um, I emailed Robert Brewer and said, are you still taking ideas, you know, and you know, what kind of ideas do you like? And he got back to me and he said, do you want to do a column about, um, or do you want to do a monthly blog about journalism? I said, you don't have to do it, but it's an idea if you'd like to do it, or you can just pitch me, you know, whatever um, ideas you have. And I'm going, oh my God, are you kidding me? A monthly blog yes <laughs> of course and so i've been doing that i've done three now so you know I've, i do one every month um it comes out towards the end of the month and you know it's made me realize because um you know i've been I, i've been interviewing a lot of experts lately um for various things that i've been doing um for encyclopedia britannica and for um this this latest vet um uh, um, article, um, veterinary article that I've been doing. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm not an expert at anything. And then I said, yes, you are. I, I wrote something on the, um, the, the TAF thread about this. It's like, of course I'm an expert. I'm an expert in journalism. For God's sake, I'm writing for, you know, one of the top magazines in the country, you know, a national magazine about journalism. So I'm an expert in journalism and I'm finally, finally, letting myself actually say that and and it's been just a transformation for me i don't know i you know i don't know how a lot of mothers feel but um when i became a mother i lost a lot of confidence in myself as a as a um in work in my work life i don't know um why but i did it it, it took me a long time to get back into um career career mode because i was in mom 
mom world for a long time, many, many years, and that's all I could concentrate on. But, you know, probably an evolutionary thing, right? Um, but um, now I'm, I'm, this is just, it's taught me a huge lesson, you know, um, that writers, I think, the problem with us right we writers right is that you know writing is such a subjective thing right somebody could read your piece and go i don't like that or you know whatever right and it makes us feel like oh maybe i'm not as skillful or not as an ex not as much of an expert as i thought i was right and it makes you question yourself because you know not everyone is going to like you know, a creative endeavor, right? A movie or, or whatever. And as creatives, we take that personally, right? And it and it eats into our confidence. And so we have to remind ourselves, right? We are we are we have skills, we have expertise and experience counts. I just wanted to say that. So thank you. Well Allison, it is obvious how much fun you are having with this new writer's digest gig. Um, yeah. This is some of the best writing from you that I've seen, and it's obvious that you are oh, digging this you. big time. Thank you. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, I think we all have to realize, you know, we, we are experts, right? You've got mm -hmm. people that have been doing something for a couple of months online, calling themselves experts, right? And making money, right? And, being, and, and gaining respect because they have the confidence, right? You know, we were taught, right. I think in our generation, we were taught you have to, you know, you know, start at the bottom and, you know, climb up the ladder and, you know, do your time. Right. But these kids, right. They're just saying, you know, screw the gatekeepers. We're just doing it now. And kudos to them. Kudos. Right. It's a changing I mean, world. Yeah. But it, however, it's a lot right? different how, from when I however, first started freelancing. That's for sure. World, right. But we we have the expertise. Right. And we have the experience to back it up. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So, yep. you know what I mean? Could us That's that, it. Right? They have three months experience, <laughs> right? Some of us have like two decades and then some, right? That's it. So, 45 you know, that, years for me. Yep. It counts. <laughs> experience counts. How can someone as youthful as me have been writing for 45 years? I don't know, How Don. It's like, what do you do? What cream do you use? <laughs> <laughs> well, Don, I'm on an older laptop, which is why you can't see my picture, but uh, I just What are you hiding, Mike? Huh? What are you hiding? <laughs> I'm just on a laptop. Well, yeah, I'm you know sitting here with scotch. No, I'm just kidding. No, but to pick back up what Allison said, I've actually spent the last four weeks um, in a playwriting class over at um, the Cary Arts Center put on by a friend of mine named Ian Finley. And the first class, Ian told us the whole solution to writer's block. He said, writer's block does not exist. Said, there is no one alive who can sit me down and tell me that it exists. And he said, I have the solution. And he said, I want each of you for the four week duration of this course, home every night and just write something for 10 minutes. And the great thing that I love, he said, it doesn't even have to make sense. He says, I don't want it to make sense. And let me tell you, with the exception of last week when my bad work week influenced my behavior. Um, I can now safely and very um, confidently proclaim I'm a writer because with the exception of a few days last week, I've been writing every single night. There you go, dude. I've been writing something that could, and he said, I want you to write it in, you know, the format of the, you know, and, um, you know, stage, uh, what stage actors use. In, in that format. So I've actually written something that's kind of, uh, I think, pretty funny. But yes, I am now a writer. Just like Allison said, I am a writer because we have the expertise. My so congratulations can I, um, on that. Can I piggyback on, on that? There are um, two gentlemen in Hollywood. They're therapists of all things but they're really famous because so many of their clients have gone on to write, you know, Academy Award winning or Emmy winning movies and television, and they um, work with actors and that kind of thing. And so someone actually talked them into writing a book. And one of the things they will have people do because anxiety is such a big part of the process is when you sit down, set a timer for like a minute or five minutes, I forget what it is, and basically um, 
pray to yourself that you will write the worst material ever for that allotted time. And I've never been able to bring myself to do it, but apparently it works because their clients have gone on to produce <clears throat> um, award-winning material on the highest levels. Oh, like getting the crap out of the way early. Uh-huh. <laughs> Lisa, because you know when when Ian said to me, I don't want it to make sense. I don't you know care what you write about. You can write about whatever. He, um, I'll have to maybe share it, but he he gave us a picture. I'll have to scan it and put it out on the on the group and whatever. And it was taken at an old folks' home, and they are the man is dressed up up as a king, the woman is dressed up as a queen, and they just have the most. The, the the most saddest look on their faces. So I just kind of took that. And for the last few weeks, I've just been writing absolute rubbish about the two of them running a kingdom. <laughs> Does anyone else have any final thoughts, anything to share or any last questions for Elisa before we break? What am I right? Oh, what was? One of my writer friends gave me this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. There you go. So when you start to write, start your <laughs> and don't stop till the final grain is down. Yes. That's right. Yeah. It works too. <laughs> I told Lisa, myself. Thank you so very, very much for joining us today, yeah. talking with us, sharing your experiences and, and your career advice. We really appreciate it. This has been great fun. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. So I hope you all had a good time this thank evening. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming tonight. I hope that you enjoyed it, uh, Elisa, also. And I will see you all next month. Y'all have a great week. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.